Exodus chapter 7 today. And we're going to do uh, 1 through 13. Exodus 7, 1 through verse 13. Verse 1. And the Lord said to Moses, See, I've made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. Moses and Aaron did so. They did just as the Lord commanded them. Now Moses was 80 years old. And Aaron was 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, Prove yourselves by working a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, Take your staff and cast it down before Pharaoh, that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh summoned the wise men and the sorcerers, and they, the magicians of Egypt, also did the same by their secret arts. For each man cast down his staff, and they became serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Still, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Pray with me. Uh, Father, we ask, Lord, that uh, during this time that our hearts would be open to your word, that we would hear the things that you want us to hear today, that we might have understanding, that we might listen in the fullest sense of the word, as in to hear you, but also to walk in your ways, to respond with submissive hearts and obedience to what you want from us this morning. Uh, Father, this we're kind of diving into the deep end today, thinking about your sovereignty and, and Pharaoh's hardness of heart. Would you give us insight into this from your word? We know that our insights on our own are worth pretty much nothing, but your insights are worth everything. For in you, there is only truth. So may we comprehend it today. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, back in my college dorm days, if you want to know what happens and at a Bible school dorm when you're going to college, there's a few things that often happen in the evenings. In the evenings, you do homework, and a lot of homework. I, I realized, I was thinking about this, I was studying uh, one Greek verse a night, you know, New Testament Greek verse, and I was spending about an hour just translating stuff. That's amazing. I, I wish I, I mean, I wish I was doing that to this day because it's like use it or lose it. And so most of that stuff is not nearly as sharp as it used to be. Uh, another thing that would happen in the evenings is someone would do something stupid and call everybody else to come watch. That's college dorm life. Uh, one night, I remember what, I remember exactly what it was and, and what I got myself into. I didn't realize until it was almost too late uh, when a bunch of guys came in the room and say, head up to the roof. And, and of course, I can't not look, you know. So I go up to the roof and on the top of my dorm roof, I see a group of guys and they all have uh, plates from the dining hall in their hands, you know, like real plates. And they start throwing them over the fence into the parking lot below, and, and, and I, they didn't hand me a plate. I didn't do it. I promise. I'm on video right now. I promise. I didn't do it. But I was standing there watching it. And as soon as they threw them, they all start running into the stairwell and down the steps. And I was kind of realizing, oh, I'm the last guy here. I didn't throw anything, but we do have a public safety that is looking around for things like this and stupid things students do. And so I dashed away as well. Um, so pranks and stupid things that you do in college. The other thing you do in your dorm room is you have deep theological discussions about whatever you just learned that day that you are now an expert on. <laughs> yes, yes. I was an expert on a lot of things. In fact, uh, one of my roommates actually 
always disagreed with me on any theological topic I brought up. I don't care what topic it was, he disagreed with me and it drove me nuts. Uh, I found out maybe a year or two into my time with him in my room is he, he kind of confessed something to me. He said, uh, Niall, I just enjoy playing the devil's advocate. I'm like, you could have told me that two years ago. Like, I thought literally you disagreed with everything we were learning in class. And he's like, no, no. And, and so I said, why do you do that to me? And, and he said, uh, I just want to see if you know what you're talking about. That's pretty smart, right? Now, even as frustrating as that was, I did feel a little bit, well, <laughs> I felt justified later when, when he was at a church and he was preaching. And, and I, I, had, I was talking to him about his preaching ministry and how's that going. And, and he said, well, I have a little problem when I preach. And I said, well, what is it? And he says, I kind of tend to start arguing with myself when I preach. <laughs> you're, you're playing devil's advocate with yourself while you preach? The devil's got no place in the pulpit, you know, so you got to stop doing that. Don't do that. And he's like, it just comes naturally. I'm like, I know I went through years of it. But anyway, uh, we're not going to do that while we preach. That's not a great idea. Um, you know what one of the most popular topics is when you're arguing in the dorm, I mean, discussing in the dorm room with uh, your friends. It's typically on the sovereignty of God. Like, just how in control is God of all things? And if he is in control of all things, does that turn us into robots that just do what he wants us to do? If I, if I do something stupid, is it because he is sovereign over it? Of, of the guy who threw the plate off the roof? You know, is it all just predetermined anyway? And so it's just kind of like fatalistic almost? And so we'd have these conversations about God's sovereignty. Or, or versus human freedom. Are we truly free to make our own choices? This is one of those famous theological topics. It's very fun to talk about it in the dorm. I find in real life, we never actually land the plane when we talk to somebody. Maybe even in the dorm too. We, we never land the plane like, well, here's how it really is. The end. So I was asked by some grace folks. Will you be talking about the hardening of Pharaoh's heart by God? And I said, I am planning on talking about that. And this is the message. Okay, so um, here we go. Uh, Moses and Aaron, in, in, in the passage we just read, God gives them their marching orders. God says something very curious. He says, uh, Moses, you're going to be like me. You're going to be like God. And your brother Aaron is going to be like the prophet. And so God is setting up this idea of God speaking to prophets, prophets speak to people. So even when they were in front of Pharaoh, Pharaoh's like looking at these two guys and, and, and Aaron's doing the talking and I can see like Moses beside him, like, you know, he's the authority guy, you know, uh, and, and he's just the guy standing there. You don't get to talk to Moses. You only get to talk to Aaron. He, he's the mouthpiece. And so Moses stands in for God, the authority guy. And, and Aaron stands in for the prophet, the guy who's sharing the message. And the message is, let my people go. I know you can't resist it. Do you just need to get it out of your system? Okay. Pharaoh, Pharaoh. Whoa, baby. Let my people go. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, when I told myself I was going to do that this week, I had in my mind more audience participation. <laughs> Did you guys have a childhood? Did you go to Awana? It's early. I know it's early. Yeah, okay. All right, all right. Man, I wasn't going to sing it on my own. Okay, so um, they go into Pharaoh, let my people go, and, and, and God predicts that Pharaoh's heart is going to be hardened. Verse 3, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh won't listen to you. He's like, be ready. He's not going to listen. And it says, verse 6, Moses and Aaron did exactly, I'll, I'll, I'll insert that word, but they did just as the Lord had commanded them. And then it says their age. Um, verse eight. Now God says to them, Pharaoh's going to ask for a sign that this is legit, that I am who I say I am. He wants a sign, a miracle, and, and, and you're going to do one for him. You're going to throw the staff on the ground. It's going to become a snake. 
And then the interesting thing is, of course, that not only does that staff become a snake, but Pharaoh says, bring in my magicians. And through their secret arts, you might argue demonic power, their staffs also become serpents. But of course, the twist is that God's staff swallows their staffs. Maybe, maybe there's something here, an echo of the Red Sea when Pharaoh gets completely swallowed up. The swallowing's begun. Still, verse 13, Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Now, we're talking about free will and one of the things that makes people very nervous about free will is, and I think I've said this myself, is if you're going to truly love somebody, you got to have free will. You can't force somebody to love you. And, 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 we, and we think about that with how we relate to God. Although I do think it's a little more complicated than human romantic relationships. So the preacher likes to say, notice how love has to be free. But what you're doing is you're comparing human love to the love that we have between God and us. And I think there's more going on there than just romantic love. Now, um, I read a book on this. I, I, I like it. I'd recommend it to you. Um, and I just, I just want to give like the briefest summary of, of free will in here. When we say free will, it really does matter what we mean by free will. What does it mean to be free? Um, does... <laughs> So I got question marks here. And by the end, I want to remove the question marks. I want to come back to this slide at the end and, and give like a last take on it. But when we talk about free will, a lot of times what people mean when they say that is that you're free from the machine. Now you say, what is the machine? Do any of you like sci-fi? The, the, the machine is when something takes over you and you get programmed like a robot to do whatever the programmer wants you to do. So free will can't mean that you're impacted by some outside force and you're programmed like a robot to do whatever you're supposed to do. How can that be love? So if you watch sci-fi movies and the alien takes over someone in their mind and makes them do weird things, you know, that's like the machine. That's not free will. The second one is uh, you need to have freedom from the gunman. Now you're like, what's the gunman? Well, the gunman is... You're being coerced. Gun to your head. You have to do this. You have to sign this. You have to make this decision. I'm making you make it. And if you don't make it, I will hurt you. I will do something to you. And so there, 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 you have to be free from the gunman. You have to make a real free will choice without being forced into it. Being forced is not free will. And now we get into some really interesting places where... People, uh, philosophers that write about free will will talk about being, having the freedom of the heart. And what they mean is your heart can't force you to do anything either. So what they mean by that is um, say, uh, say uh, your emotions are getting the best of you and you make a decision that you regret later. Well, you were carried away by your passions. You were carried away by your heart. But a free will decision has to somehow stand above your heart. Kind of like, I'm above my emotions. I'm above my feelings. I could choose A. I could choose B. I am above it all. Try that when you're sitting next to that beautiful person that you want to ask to marry you. Say to her, you look really lovely tonight, but I'm not going to listen to my heart. I want to stand above my heart and make a free will decision about you. Do I want to spend my life with you? And somewhere above it all, I'm going to make this decision, but it's not going to be based on you or how I feel about you or, the, or, or, or those romantic feelings. I got to be above all that in passion, no passion. See how far that gets you. But, but I'm, talking, I'm saying that when philosophers talk about free will, they'll talk about you being free from the emotion. I say good luck. Okay, all right, good luck. Now, uh, lastly, and by the way, this is adapted from the book uh, God Reforms Hearts by Thaddeus Williams. I do recommend it. It is a deep read, so I prepared you for that. Um, then there's the freedom of the reformer. Now, the reformer, uh, Thaddeus Williams just means God. That is, 
that God can't do anything to your heart, you need to be able to make a free decision. He can influence He can woo you, and if you're an Armenian or a Wesleyan, you probably are familiar with that language, where where he can kind of draw you in and and, and show you how good he is, but but he can't cause your heart to make a decision for him. He he can just kind of have some influence over you. So there has to be freedom from God. Do I agree with all those? Well, at least two. And we'll come back to it at the end. Let's get to the text, though. Um, So, just looking at the text, if I'm just preaching the text and, and telling you what God is sharing with us here, I want you to notice verse 3. You got to see verse 3. So you're going to ask, let my people go. Or you're going you're to declare it, let my people go. Verse 3, but I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Okay, who's going to do the hardening? God is going to harden Pharaoh's heart. There are three different words for harden in this, in this context. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure that they make the most sense for you to understand this morning, to understand this, but one of the words means to make strong. One of them means to harden. One of them means heavy. And, and, and God is, whether God's saying his heart is heavy or hard or strong, the end result is really the same. He's stubborn and he won't let the people go. Even when some of his own court people, magicians say, you got, you got to let those people go. He won't do it. Even when he says he's going to do it, he changes his mind and doesn't want to do it. Because God says, I am hardening his heart. So my conclusion is that God has complete freedom and sovereignty to act on the heart. He can do whatever he wants with your heart and my heart. And we don't become robots because of that. He, do, he, does, he doesn't make us and, and force us, but he can act on us in such a way that we can still make a free will choice that he is operating on our hearts to, to cause us to do. That somehow both of those things are true. Look at Proverbs 21.1. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord, and he turns it wherever he will. You know about streams of water. Some people put ponds on their property. Some of you like, remember maybe walking by a creek when you were young and watching the water as it goes. And God says, "I I can do that with the heart. I can turn it any way I want to turn it. Okay, then. God, you're in charge of the heart. You can work deeper than I can even imagine. Now, of course, this comes up in Romans 9, and that's probably why a lot of people think of the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, because Paul is talking in Romans 9 about salvation issues. Namely, in that context, he's talking about why are there such a large group of Jewish people who have a hardness of heart? And Paul says, I wish that I could just be cut off for the sake of my brothers and sisters, the Jewish people who don't believe in Jesus as Messiah. Like he has such a heart for his own people. But but there's this conversation about like, well, why? Why why is there hardening? Why why doesn't everybody just get it that Jesus is Savior? Why, Why did he come to his own people, the Jewish people, and they didn't receive him? And then Paul talks about the inclusion of the Gentiles, you and me, into the family of God. So this is what he says about Pharaoh. Uh, For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I've raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then, as a result, so then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. So ultimately, God has freedom to say, you're the mercied one, you're the hardened one. And you're like, well, that that just, that I got questions about that. I've got concerns about that. How is that fair? And that's really where Paul's going in Romans as well. Someone's going to say, is God unjust to have mercy on anybody he wants or harden whoever he wants? None of us have complete freedom, do we? to like do whatever we want. We live in a free country, but there's certain restrictions on our freedoms 
And some of those restrictions are really good. Like, for instance, you should never shout fire in a crowded room if there's not a fire. But there's other restrictions too. Things you can't do, places you can't go. But God is only restricted by his own character and his own holiness. He'll never lie, for instance. He's only restricted by the nature of who he is. Otherwise, he has complete freedom to act and to act on the heart. And Paul's point is just that. He can do whatever he wants. He can do whatever he wants. Now, I gotta, I'm building my case here, so I know you might still have questions. We've got to keep going. I want to get to the next point. When you start moving down the list, you also find out here that God is committed to magnifying his name. So going back to the Romans one, uh, just for a second, Paul says, for this very purpose, I raised you up. Who? Pharaoh. For this purpose, that I might show my power in you, that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. I'm going to come back to the proclaiming his name in all the earth in two weeks. But for now... I raised you up for a purpose, Pharaoh. And this is the purpose. The purpose is to proclaim me. Proclaim me. Now look at the text in front of us. Right around verse, uh, let's see, five. Let's do four. Pharaoh won't listen to you. Then I'll lay my hand on Egypt and bring my host, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. Why? What's the purpose? The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. So he says, I'm going to multiply signs and wonders. That's what he says in the text. We call them plagues. God calls them signs and wonders. Have you ever said, hey, you know that famous passage about Moses and Aaron and the 10 signs and wonders? It just doesn't roll off the tongue, does it? The signs and the wonders. You know the signs and wonders. No, I don't. Do you know the plagues? Oh, yeah. Gnats and flies and darkness. And, and it ends with the death of the firstborn. I know the plagues. Notice that we tend to emphasize the human part of this whole thing. These are really hard things that are happening to human beings. But God calls them something different over and over and over and over again. In this text, he calls them my signs and wonders. Maybe we're missing something when we call them plagues. You think? Maybe we're, maybe we're pushing something down that God wants to magnify when we call them our word instead of God's word. When we call them God's word and we say, these are the 10 signs and wonders, what it calls attention to is this. Very explicit. God is committed to magnifying his name. God is committed to his name being known throughout the whole earth, including to the Egyptians, including to his kids, the Israelites. I want to be known and the 10 plagues is about making me known. You know that responsive reading we did today? Did you feel a little uncomfortable with a couple of those things where you responded, his steadfast love endures forever? And you might have said to yourself, well, it's in the biblical text, so I know it's okay to say. But does it feel weird to say he killed the firstborn, his steadfast love endures forever? Or is that just me? Um, hmm. Movies. If you watch movies and TV, if you watch medical TV shows, or really any TV, you'll certainly see somebody that's having a, a, a near-death experience, and, and they're laying on the table, and they get the, the paddles out, and they're going to shock their heart back to life. Or it goes like this, or someone's going to do mouth-to-mouth -mouth and resuscitate them. And as a viewer, you're watching this, and if you actually care about the character like the writers would like you to, like good writing makes you care about the characters. If you care about the character that's on the table and whether they're going to resuscitate him or her or not, you're kind of invested in, in seeing the heart start beating again on the monitor. You know what I'm talking about. Or, or the big breath that they take. And you're like, oh, thank goodness. Occasionally you're like, 
I could see him killed off. I, you know, it'd be okay. I was just watching a show yesterday and, and, and the character was on the table and I was like, I could go either way, you know. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was actually thinking, I was actually thinking, this might be a more interesting story if this main character died. Now, you know someone wrote that story. And you know that they try to milk it for all it's worth to make you watch on the edge of your seat and then commercial break. And you're like, oh, I can't get popcorn now. I got I to gotta see, you know, or I know we're streaming now. There's less of those commercials sometimes. But, um, but, but, but they want to hold you in that moment for as long as they can and make you feel everything you need to feel. And then they tell you what's up. Um, so... God is not writing a work of fiction. Like, 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 you know in those stories, it's the writer and the director, and, and they're calling the shots, and whether they pull at your heartstrings or not, they're trying to do something to get an emotional reaction out of you. That's why you got to wait forever to find out if he lives or dies. In the show I watched yesterday, he lived, and I was like, okay, all right, I guess. All right. Um, God, God is invested in the history of the world to bring it to completion for his glory. And so the story of the signs and wonders, you know, the 10 signs and wonders that we call the plagues, he, God is doing this to call attention to how great he is, that Egypt would know it, that Israel would know it, that everybody would know it. He is invested in the story and he's telling the story. He's causing it to come about. This is all about his plan. You got to know that when it comes to God working on the heart, hardening or giving mercy or whatever God chooses to do, it's all in service to the same end, the glory of God. And if you don't like that, I can't help you. I can't help you because there's a being who made you and made this world and he oversees everything in it. And I totally believe he gives us real choices to make. We're going to look at those in just a second. But, but in the end, everything is for his glory. It's all for the purpose of what he wants. And what he wants is to make himself known. How many times did we already see in the text that they will know that I am Yahweh? People need to know. And God wants them to know. And again, the only thing I can say to you then, at the second point, as I'm, I'm finishing the second point here, is... Is that the purpose for which you're living your life? Because if you're not, you're out of step with the story, capital S story that God is telling and that he's directing and it's unfolding in front of you. And if you can't say my life is for his glory, you're in the wrong story. You think it's about you. And it was never about you. And you got a different story to get on because he's going to bring it to completion the way he wants. That's why you exist. Number three, God reveals the heart of a sinner. So uh, verse 13, Pharaoh saw the staff turn into a snake. He was like, whatever, bring my guys in. The guys come in and through more demonic powers, they can turn their staffs into snakes. But then theirs get swallowed by Moses and Aaron's staff, the staff of God. And it says, even after he saw that and thought, huh, as a power struggle, I lost. Um, still, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And, and, and the Hebrew implies someone hardened it. That's what the Hebrew uh, uh, grammar implies. He would not listen to them as the Lord had said. So let me give you a very, very quick survey of Pharaoh's hard heart. Because what's going on here, God is saying, I want to show you what goes on inside a sinner. You, you ever had an x-ray? Anybody got screws in their body to put you back together? Some of you do. Yeah, yeah. You ever seen them on an x-ray, like what they look like and where they're at? You, you've seen the screws that are in your own body. Yeah, you, you know where they're at. Yeah, that's kind of cool, right? You ever seen like uh, one of those ones where, you know, someone survived a bullet wound, you know, but the bullet's like in them and you see the x-ray and you're like, oh, there it is, you know. Um, God says, 
I'm going to give you an x-ray on what's going on inside the heart. You remember the Grinch and his heart that was way too small and then it grew and they show you what's going on in there. Like when God tells us about Pharaoh here in this text, it's almost like he's saying, here's the x-ray. Here's what's going on with Pharaoh. Take a look. So there's 10 plagues. I know you're like, boy, this is getting long already, isn't it? Uh, Okay, I'm going to go quickly. But look at the first five signs and wonders. See, I did it there, didn't I? Plagues, no, signs and wonders. Look at the first five signs and wonders. The Nile turns to blood. Pharaoh's heart remained hardened. There's a plague of frogs. Pharaoh's heart hardened his heart. The text says he, he hardened his heart and he wouldn't let the people go. Then there's the gnats. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Who did that? Oh, mysterious, isn't it? Uh, flies. Pharaoh hardened his heart. He hardened his heart. Livestock die. Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Who did that? Interesting. And then you get to number six. Boils. And now it says, the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh. By number six, At least by number six, we see God taking a very active role in the hardening of Pharaoh. Hail, it says Pharaoh hardened his heart. Locust, God announces, he declares that he has hardened his heart. Uh, Darkness, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And then when the death of the firstborn is predicted, it's predicted, it says, uh, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Um, I heard, I, I like to listen to how preachers handle hard texts. And I, I was listening to one preacher talk about this. And, and he said, you know, God, he didn't, he didn't want to use all those terrible plagues. He just had to because Pharaoh was so stubborn, you know. And, and I'm listening to this and, I, and, and, and he's talking about the loss of life that happened, you know. And, and, and that God, he just, he had to do this because Pharaoh was so evil, And I'm like, well, Pharaoh was evil. And the Pharaohs, plural, were evil people. But God decided to do this. He determined, I'm going to show my signs and wonders. And and then he hardens Pharaoh's heart so that Pharaoh can't let them go until God's done. It's like God is saying, I'm not done with you yet. Remember the first time you said, who is Yahweh that I should obey him? Maybe by number six, maybe Pharaoh would have been like, uh, maybe, maybe I will. God says, no, you're not. You're not letting my people go yet. I'm not done yet. And you're like, man, that just blows my mind. How does that work? Well, I'm just looking at the text in one through five. God doesn't at least explicitly enter the equation. And in the second five, he is entering into this. And he's literally hardening Pharaoh's heart. It's almost like God is saying, kind of like a Romans 1 thing, this is what you turned yourself over to. I'm just bringing it to completion. You hardened your heart with me. We're going to finish this up. How many times in Romans 1 does it say God gave them over? He gave them over to what they wanted. Three times. You should be like, whoa, that's scary when God gives you what you want. Here's the thing about hearts. A couple things about hearts. Uh, One is Egyptian mythology and the heart. Did you know that Pharaoh's heart was considered to be a pure heart because he's the king of Egypt? But the way that you would know a pure heart when you died, by the way, when they mummified you in, in Egypt, they would leave your heart in there. Why? Because they thought in the afterlife, your heart was going to be weighed against a, a feather. So on one side of the scale is a feather. On the other side is your heart. And if your heart is heavier than the feather, that means you're a wicked person and you go to judgment. So you're supposed to have a a light heart. But what does Pharaoh have? A heavy heart. That's actually the Hebrew word. The Hebrew word sometimes says his heart was heavy. What's God saying? I've tested Pharaoh's heart. There's evil there. There's evil there. So he's, we're going to keep going on this direction that he set himself. The other thing I'll say about the heart is for all those people that want to say, 
I don't think God should be acting on our heart. I don't, I don't think God, like I want to be completely free. I don't want God messing with my heart. I'm worried I'm going to turn into the robot that just has to be programmed to do. For people that are worried about that, I want you to think about this. Um, Romans 6, 16. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you're slaves to the one you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? See, when I think of sin, I think kind of narrowly. I think sin is the, the bad thing that I said or, or, the, or that thought that I had that I shouldn't have thought. Or I think of it only as like missing the mark, which it is. Sin is anything we say, think, or do that displeases God. But sin is a powerful force at work in your body and in your heart. Read Romans and tell me that's not the case. In Romans, we find out sin is working in your flesh to cause you to do the things that you actually don't want to do, Paul says. Remember that whole section? I do the things I don't want to do because sin is with me. Evil's with me. It's like right here always. And so I do those things that I really don't want to do. So how free is the heart, Paul? How free are anybody's hearts when sin is there and acting on you as a powerful force for evil. I'm not saying sin is a person, but it's talked about in personified language. It's not just the thing that you did. It's a power at work in your body. And you need to be freed from that by Christ. You see, not only is there sin working on your heart, but Satan's working on the heart of an unbeliever. 2 Timothy 2, 25 and 26 God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Satan captures the hearts of people and God grants repentance. So when you talk about the heart being free, do you mean free from Satan and free from sin? Because those things are powerfully at work in the hearts of unbelievers. Free will? So let's go back to my free will slide. I said I would kind of conclude with it. What do we mean by free will? Do we mean freedom from the machine? Yes. I don't believe anybody's programmed here. It's not like God just gets in there and sets something a little bit different and, and you're just now like, I got it. You know, I do believe you have to make a decision. You have a decision to make. Jesus died for you. And you can't respond to that like a robot. You have to make a decision and God's going to hold you accountable for it. Then there's the freedom of the gunman. I think that's a good statement. I don't think we're coerced. There's not a gun to your head. You got to make a decision. But let me change the from in that statement to of on these next two. I believe in the freedom of the heart. That God acts on your heart so that you are able to make a choice in faith to believe him and his son Christ. That you are actually able to make that choice. Our Arminian friends, at least my Arminian friends, would say, God woos you and he kind of draws you in. I'm on the side that says, God chose you and you're going to make, when God shows you how good he is, you're going to choose him. When God operates on your heart, you come to your senses. That was, second, that was the Timothy language, right? You come to your senses and God enables you to see how beautiful he is and you make a choice for him. I believe in the freedom of the heart. I also believe in the freedom of the reformer. God can have mercy on whoever he wants. He can harden whoever he wants. And some of those last two things work together. Do I understand it perfectly? No. That's why we debate and talk in the dorm rooms. But I believe both of those are true. Applications. My time is way up. I hope it's been helpful to you though. Um, application one, be humble. Be humble. Like what, is, what does Paul say in Romans 9? If you read Romans 9 and someone says, God's not fair. Paul's answer is not, well, let me explain it to you a little bit better. And maybe you'll get it this time. No, Instead, Paul says, uh, I think he's the potter and you're the clay. 
Are you going to talk back to the potter for the way he arranged things? You don't like the plagues? Tell that to the potter. Oh, wait, maybe you shouldn't because you're just clay. There is a pridefulness that comes into play here where we shake our fist at God and say, why would you do this? Not healthy, not good. Better that you would stand in awe and wonder of who God is and how he's made his creation. And then when you look at Hebrews chapter three, you find God saying, don't harden your hearts. Thank you, I thought you were responsible for that. No, God says you're responsible too. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Today, if you're sitting in church and you've never accepted Christ as your savior, don't harden your heart because you heard from God today. Don't do it. Don't do it. By the way, that command makes no sense unless you have a free will decision to make. Don't harden your heart. It's a dangerous thing because look at where it took Pharaoh. And finally, the last part of Hebrews 3 says, but exhort one another daily as long as it's called today so that you won't be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. So apparently one of the reasons the church exists is to help each other not be hardened. How could you help someone not be hardened? That's what you got to think about. I think if we humble ourselves before God and stand in awe and wonder of his plan, I think we sleep better at night. And we're glorifying him for all of his signs and wonders and all of his power. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for uh, what you said here and uh, that we can believe it, we can trust it, that you are indeed strong. With a mighty hand, you led your people out of Egypt. Your steadfast love endures forever. And, and, and we're shocked by what we don't understand sometimes. But I pray that that shock would become awe and wonder at who you are. And the fact that I can't comprehend how free will interacts with your sovereignty. I just can't get it. But I know that it's true. I'm so glad that you did heart surgery on me and caused me to see your goodness. I'm so grateful that I have nothing to boast in of myself, that I can only boast in you. So now we want to respond in praise and give you honor and glory. You deserve it all. It's what our life is actually supposed to be all about. And so we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.